Good morning and welcome to Let's Talk Autism. I'm Nancy Allspaugh Jackson. And Thrilled I'm to be here. Shannon Penrod. Thrilled to be here with Hi, my friend you? and, and your lovely mauve. Is, that is what it mauve? I thought that's... it was cranberry. Oh, it kind of is cranberry, isn't it? <laughs> cranberry and purple, sort of. It's very fun. Um, but uh, thrilled to be here with you. And normally we start out the show within the news, but we have a new segment that we're bringing to you uh, at least once a month that we, you know, Nancy and I, when we cover in the news, a lot of times there's research studies and we do our level best. Right. But we're not scientists hilarious. by any means. Right. right. And uh, so we have uh, reached out to, there are a group of people who work in the research and development department of the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And on a monthly basis, they bring us one of our, their bright up and coming stars uh, to join us. And so that is what we're doing this morning. We're welcoming Nick Marks to the program. And Nick, we're gonna start by having you tell us a little bit about what you do at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And welcome to the show. Hi, Nancy and Shannon. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Nick. I actually work in the research and development department. Um, basically, what we're looking at is uh, new intervention strategies and just any type of new research that um, incorporates ASD and how that can change our intervention um, for the better. So today I'm going to be presenting on a piece that was in a behavior and practice journal by Lugo and colleagues, and it's titled Developing Procedures to Improve Therapists and Child Rapport in Early Intervention. Um, and the reason that we're going into this is because we want to show that as a behavioral science, ABA, that there's research into ethics and compassion in our field. And we want to apply that research to our everyday practice in our clinics. Um, our mission encompasses family satisfaction, and we're really using this research in ethics and compassion passion to encourage an environment aligned with similar practices to what the medical world has to offer. So we need to attempt to understand concepts like how building rapport with a patient and with a patient's family um, really goes to affect the clinical outcomes. Now, not a lot of studies have examined this idea that building rapport will affect patient outcomes. However, we did find one study, the study that I just mentioned, that suggested a framework of how to build rapport with our clients. So for me, myself, I'm really big on this ethical concept of beneficence, and that means doing the most good for the most people or the most patients. Therefore, building a healthy relationship with our patients through rapport, through building trust, can help us to meet this goal of beneficence, as it allows us to meet the needs of every single one of our clients that we have. So why is rapport so important to us? Well, if parents don't believe we have a good rapport with their child, they likely won't use our services. And also, if we don't develop that rapport with our child as behavioral therapists, we tend to fail to understand behavior, potential reinforcers, the environment that the child functions best in. And this leads us to not be able to function as our intervention becomes faulty. Now, a way to think about this is um, when we fail to do our jobs as practitioners and we don't build a rapport, it's just like if a doctor doesn't develop a rapport with a patient. They may fail to, the patient may fail to um, go over their symptomology with the doctor because they don't have the patient's tr or the doctor's trust. Um, so let's go into this study. So what did this study look at? The study was utilized to identify procedures that may help build rapport among behavioral health therapists. This study suggested a framework for just that, for building rapport. The objective of the study was to show therapists that what items and activities can act as reinforcers to improve the child's overall condition during therapy sessions by building that rapport and that trust with the child. Now, it took six therapists or staff members at a university-based clinic and trained them to use pre-session pairing procedures. And these pre-session pairing procedures were procedures that had already been proven to be effective in prior research. Now, these pairing procedures were allowing the child to have access to tangible items and activities that their patients may like before they went into a session, a lot like a, a preference assessment. Now, the pairing procedure itself involved engaging in the activities of the child's choice, delivering those preferred items, and imitating the child's actions to gain the child's trust, along with ensuring the child's happiness. Now, happiness is key here, not just in building rapport, but we as practitioners, we tend to forget that children need to be engaged and happy when they're learning. And I believe that uh, happiness is key in building rapport with children. I'm sure you as parents can understand that when a child is unhappy, they tend to not want to do what you want them to do. So let's get back into the study. The authors suggested six key points of action that should be involved in pre-session pairing skills. So I'm going to go over those six uh, points of action here. Now, one was staying in the arms 
distance of a child, such that the therapist is always engaging the child while having the child's attention. This is important. The child needs to begin to trust the therapist and know that the therapist is always going to be right by the child if they need anything. Now, the second point was providing praise for appropriate playing skills. Now, we all know positive reinforcement is enormous in the success of ABA therapy, and this needs to be structured so that the children feel comfortable and know that they're doing the right thing at the right times. Now, three, the therapist repeat the vocalizations of a child. Now, this is kind of funny, and it's meant to be in a playing way, such that if the child barks like a dog, the therapist barks back like a dog. And play is so important for all children, and we need to teach children that playing and having fun is indeed an acceptable thing. Now, four, therapists imitate appropriate playing skills. Now, this goes back to play. We need to ensure children are having fun and just playing playing like kids. This serves as reinforcement as children see that they're playing correctly when their therapist imitates their play skills. Now, number five, the therapist describes what the appropriate play skills are that the client is doing and provides a tangible item to them. Again, this concept is reinforcing and helps to maintain the child's appropriate behavior while extinguishing inappropriate play skills. Now, number six, and the last of the point, is that the therapist creates a new activity by changing the function of a toy such that they turn a book into a playhouse. We need to make children feel as though they should be creative with their play skills. Now, all these pairings, like I um, said in the past, were tested by the six behavioral therapists, and measurements were used to see if the behavioral therapist could actually adopt these play skills in a session environment. So why did we use this in a test environment? Well, the author derived these pre-session pairing procedures from prior literature and pairing procedures, functional analysis, and behavioral parent training that gained traction and showed efficacies. So um, what were the results of this? Well, what we found was that these, uh, these therapists who they tested these skills on were actually able to adopt these skills within about five set five one-hour sessions. And so why did we use these skills? Well, we, want, we use these skills because they help to reduce problematic behaviors. They help to reduce the aversive nature of the therapeutic se setting that is new to a child, and that helps to build rapport. Um, and other than that, prior studies have demonstrated that peering and rapport building as a treatment package combined together does in fact reduce the aversive nature of therapy and clinic setting. So now performance feedback was given to therapists after each setting indicating which skills were met. And we can utilize this in our own setting at CARD by performing similar uh, performance feedbacks from some of our BCBAs or our therapist liaisons. Um, and in conclusion, found that pre-session pairing can be used to build rapport with children receiving behavioral health services as it helps to allow the child to feel comfortable in a therapeutic se setting. Now, CARD and other healthcare providers can implement these pre-session pairing procedures before each and every session to help find reinforcers for the children and to help build trust among these children. Okay. Yeah. I, and I, that, I don't know if you were done, but that was, I, I, I've got a lot of questions and comments about okay. this because a lot of times research for me, and you, you and I talk about this all the time, that I, I, I call it the big duh, mm -hmm. right? That's like, well, right. uh, to me, it makes perfect sense what you were saying, Nick, that when you have a good relationship, and as you were saying, rapport, when a therapist and a child have a good relationship, you're going to get more done. Of course. Right? You're just going to get more done. Uh, and we say, of course, but research would say, well, is that true? But what, what they found is that it, that it does work, correct, Nick? That's the first takeaway? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So what I then I you know you listed off these six things these six pre-session pairings that because uh, that that's a mouthful in and of itself mm -hmm. pre-session pairings I was like wait a second um, but that that were found to be effective and that they also found that any therapist could do and as I as you were talking about them I was like well. Yeah, I can remember therapists doing this with my son. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking about it. Yeah, the therapist that I really loved <laughs> did yeah. this kind of stuff. Right. And that sometimes you take it for granted that some people know to do some things. And why don't other people do it? But to pare it down, to distill it to these six things and say, hey, if you do these six things, you're going to hit it out of the park. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, I kind of love this, even though I sort of felt like in the beginning, I was like, well, that's kind of a big duh, isn't it? But for people who don't know, look, if you do X, Y, and Z, you'll be more successful for the kid. It's good to have it listed. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, they found that across the board, they could teach therapists to do this rather quickly. It was the other takeaway, right? Correct, yes. Okay. Yes. Am I missing anything out of that? I think you did well there. <laughs> I was paying attention. Um, but I but think about this from a parent point of view. Because as I was thinking and, and thinking about these, I was like, would this me like make me like the therapist more, me the parent, if I saw them sticking close to the child, of course I'll tick that box. I like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. Right? That they praise my child. Of like course that. I like that. Tick that box. Um, that they repeat vocalizations that my child does. Yes, I like that too. I don't know that everybody would like that for all things but I would like I like the idea that the child does something and you do it too and that that builds rapport it creates a bond between uh, yes I like that um, imitating appropriate play skills I like that too um, and describing what they just did that was correct and offering them a reward for it gosh I'd like that therapist too and then morphing that into something that takes us from whatever play they were doing into more imaginative play uh, that's a rock star therapist to me right there. Now, Nick, are you incorporating this with all therapists now with, that are working with card clients? Well, this is a framework. This is actually just a framework, and we do want to test probably the validity of this to make sure that this works for our specific organization itself. Um, but this is definitely the framework that we should be working off of. Like you said, I mean, it's a big duh, but it's something that, you know, we have to sometimes see in writing to understand. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, so I hope that a, a lot of our car card therapists are going to be like, yeah, we do that. But for anybody who doesn't already do that, mm -hmm. I hope that they will see this and go, hey, I want to be more successful. Yeah. And if I just need to do these six things to be more successful and start my session off better, why wouldn't we? Right. Why so this we? is something we hope to see incorporated in practice. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. Uh, Nick, I just, I'm so thrilled to have you join us, and we are loving having people from your team come and, and share these things with us. Yes, it's a great act, asset to us. It really is. So thanks for being with us. If anybody has questions, Nick, is there, uh, they can write, to, you guys can write to me and I'll forward them to Nick. Let's do that. So uh, you can either write to me on the show or s.penrod at autism-live.com. All right. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you guys very much. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Um, I, I'm a little bit, I, I geek out on this kind of stuff. I get really excited about it. We recently, for those of you who don't know, I've been to two conferences recently. I went to ABAI up in San Francisco, and then I went to Cal Abba for mm -hmm. one day, and they had poster sessions. And at the poster sessions, it's uh, people like Nick. Um, sometimes it's college students who are studying to become BCBAs. Sometimes they're already BCBAs or from an organization. And they present research that they've done. Sometimes it's with one of their clients or, you know, 10 clients, whatever but they put out an idea, uh -huh. just like at a science fair, but uh -huh. it's on a level where we're talking about ABA right. being better with autism. And, and then they defend their poster. Uh -huh. So there's a session set up, and it's like a big, almost like a party, uh -huh. and they have all these boards. I'd never been to one until I, you know, I started hosting the show, but I love them. Because you just walk up to anybody, you see on the poster what the title of the study is, and most of the time I go, I have no idea what that means. I'm uh, like, no, like I, I'm reading that sentence and I'm like, is it in English? You know, but you walk up to them and say, so tell me what your, your, so what your study is, what it did, what it meant, whatever. So we were live. I went around to the posters and asked people, what is your study? And then when I didn't understand it, I would say, yeah, does that mean this? And they would go, no. And then <laughs> pretty much what we do here on the show, I go, does it mean this? No. And then they would explain it to me again. And I think they're kind of hilarious, but very informative. So those are available on our Facebook page. Oh, good. If you want to go and look at them to see uh, the one session, I went an hour and a half straight live just, and I didn't get to everybody. That's how big these things are. And I just say to parents, if you have the opportunity to go to a conference that's having a poster session, don't 
say to yourself, I don't know what to do. I don't know what they're saying and avoid it. Go. Yeah, because ask it's, questions. It's, it's, it's free. It's self-explanatory once you get there, right? Or, or the therapist, they break it down for you. You have to ask them and say, I right. don't understand that, right. but it's great for them. It's good training for them mm -hmm. and they have to defend whatever their, mm -hmm. what their study is and they're supposed to be able to speak intelligently mm -hmm. about it to anyone and it's free to ask them and you find out about what they're doing with right. the research right. and how much better ABA is getting. I get excited. I'm sorry. I, I know you do. No, that's the, that's <laughs> very case, good. We've got a great okay. guest who's yeah, coming we up. Do. Who's helping one of our Act Today families. So yeah, let's, uh, let's take a break and we're going to we'll come back and we're going to be with Mark Hildreth and he is an ex-pro wrestler uh, but now is coming to us from Paradise Exteriors. Right and we're back with Let's Talk Autism and as we said we're going to be joined by a special guest. We've got uh, Mark Hildreth. Mark welcome to the show. Welcome thank you for having me Shannon and Nancy from out there in California and we like to greet all of our visitors here at Paradise Exteriors office in Southeast Florida with a welcome to Paradise. Tell us what Paradise Exteriors does. We provide impact windows and doors, hurricane resistant impact windows and doors for homeowners to protect their homes from the damage of aggressive weather like hurricanes. And just recently, you have uh, stepped into the world of autism because I understand, Nancy, you had a family with a grant. Let's tell us the story of what's happening with this family. The family needed a, an impact uh, window for their child with autism. Because uh, they're, they've broken a few windows. Broken a I few imagine. windows, yes. And uh, Mark, you ha tell us what you have done to help this family out. Well, I received an email from Miss Ileana Herrera uh, saying that you folks granted her some money to do one window for her son's bedroom. And that piqued my interest a little bit. I, most people don't do just one window. And I dug in a little bit, spoke with her. And, and then I realized that, you know, we're always, of course, at Paradise. We're creating opportunities to give back our hard-earned good fortune but we're also very good at recognizing opportunities when they're presented to us. So we clearly saw this as an opportunity to help not one, but two families. I expressed to act today that I think that we will do this window and we'll absorb the cost and you can apply that thousand dollars to another autistic family for the need. It's Which is very, amazing. Very generous of you. Yes. But I, as you were saying, you noticed, okay, there, here's a need that we had not even thought of for this product that we have that could be helpful to the to this family. And uh, as you were just saying to us, we're, we're, your company is new to autism, but I had said welcome aboard because I think you're going to get a lot more people wanting to know about your windows. Well, I'll tell you, I, I'm impressed with how much love and money starts flying around when you say autism. Yes, it does. We have a, we actually now have a GoFundMe page up on the Paradise Exteriors website to finish off Miss Herrera's family's home for her with the rest of the windows and the doors. For the rest. And of we've the already had great response. Our manufacturer, Softlight in Ohio, they're going to contribute, and our distributors. Um, it's just so overwhelming how much money begins to be released and autism's involved. I got to tell you, I'm about ready to have a marketing change and brand these windows as um, autistic defense system. Right. Well, and there are a lot of benefits to these windows. Yes, for, in addition to the impact, there's yes, the sound so reduction. Yes, um, so these windows are, you know, I don't know what words you use, but you, high impact, but they're super, super tough. But they cut down on sound. They cut down on certain kinds of light. Talk to us about the windows. Well, the window, you're right. There's tremendous sound, what they call the sound abatement, keeping the noise out. And we found that's a more calming, relaxing environment for studies or for hobbies and interests that might act as relaxation techniques for these children. Well, and then whether they aggressively or sensitive. inadvertently break the window or come in contact with the window, it can't be broken to the point where it shatters and harms you. Which is sometimes, you know, Nancy, you've been right, through this. It can right. be life-saving. Yes, it can. Uh, when a kid puts a, uh, uh, a fist through a window and, and the you broken have shards, glass, shards of that, glass. that can open, uh, you know, 
veins and mm -hmm. lead to somebody bleeding to death. Right. So this is a really important um, thing for us to, to cover and talk about. Um, so tell, tell the folks that are watching, if they want to know more about Paradise Exteriors, where do they need to go to get more information about these windows, Mark? Well, we'd like to invite you to the Paradise Exteriors Facebook, first of all, to look at Ms. Herrera's story and hopefully uh, Paradise's lead in getting this project started. Your national listener audience can help us finish that house off. Um, our company, as of course, is always looking to give back to the community. We have an annual Thanksgiving um, food drive for people in our community. And again, this is new to us. Um, this presented it to ourselves in our laps, and we clearly saw it as a way to help uh, Miss Ileana and help you all apply that money to another family. Also, um, the man I work with, Dan Beckner, he and I were both raised by single, independent women, strong women that found themselves with a house full of children alone. But we both identified with Miss Herrera being a single mom my mother, Carol, and Dan's mother, Cookie, great women, and they're watching right now. So this is the hi, mom. Oh. Oh, hi, mom. That's my picture. Hi, this mom. picture of my mom. That's great. Oh. So Dan and I are very grateful to the job that our mothers did in very difficult circumstances. So we identified with Rivera that way as well. I well, love you, it. strong women, and as you say, you salute other strong women and are trying to help a single mom out here in a great way, which you're doing. Uh, wonderful work, and we applaud you for taking not only just fulfilling this grant, but taking it and running with it and trying to use it as a way to benefit other families. And for well, the, go ahead. We, we consider this, uh, it was a gift to us to be able to provide this gift. That's how we look at it. Uh, and again, we just posted this on our Facebook not long ago, and we've already had great response. And I'm sure that your national audience, they're probably typing in that Paradise Facebook right now. <laughs> we want to encourage people to go and make a donation of any size. Uh, that money will go towards finishing off that home. Um, and and you, you, I, I want to add, Shannon, yes. any extra money that is donated above and beyond the cost to finish this project and we're going to do it at cost the excess will go to act today so you can apply it to some other families that's our amazing. official title now is autism care today we, we go. got rid of the act today oh. so that's okay. okay i just that's... want to reiterate that that it's autism care today and for those of you who are watching who are looking at mark and you're like he looks familiar we haven't even talked about the fact that mark is an ex-pro wrestler and mark i have to say notably Look at that that you are uh, also uh, ex-military, honorably discharged from the Navy, so we salute you for your service, both as a wrestler, but also You're welcome. In, the, in the military. Uh, and I know Nancy can talk to you about the fact that there are many initiatives that are just for the military families that are affected by autism that, yes. uh, that Autism Care Today also helps. So I'm sure you guys can have a longer conversation about that. But we salute you for everything that you are doing, Mark. And we thank Paradise Exteriors for jumping on this and seeing that where there is a need and fulfilling that need. Yeah. That's a wonderful thank thing. Thank you so much. Well, I believe this is just a start to our relationship. I agree. I do, too. Thank you, Mark. We thank appreciate you. it. Thanks and thank you so me. much for inviting me on your show. I'm, I'm very honored and grateful. Uh, and again, to all the listeners out there, uh, we, are, we are a company now that is autism-minded, and uh, it's going to be on our ticket for causes that we continue to support. That's great. Don't Thank you so that. much. Thank you so much. Paradise Thank Exteriors, get on their Facebook right now. Donate what you can. Thank you, and thanks to those fabulous moms. We'll talk to you Thank soon. Thank you, ladies. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. What a great, great guy. Yeah, I know. Yes. Uh, don't, don't we love men who get it and yes. get on it and take yes. action and, are, you know, um, it's a fabulous, fabulous thing. Okay. We've got still two more two guests more to go. So we're going to pause for a minute and we're going to come back with Daniel Cher Strom. Painless. And Maxine Cher. So right. stick with us.
We're and back. We're back. We're back. Yes, welcome we're back. talking to our guests already. Uh, we, welcome back. So yeah. we want to welcome via Skype and on the phone that we have Daniel Sherstrom and Maxine Sher, and hopefully I've said your names right. Um, and we want to welcome you to the show. I am so excited because I have followed you guys for a while, and I'm a little bit starstruck having you on the show <laughs> with us. Okay, I'm just going to admit to that. So, um, but. Maybe we should talk a little bit about uh, what the, the both of you are. Maxine, you're a wonderful advocate, writer, consultant, workshop facilitator, and developer. You're a passionate champion of strengths and abilities for all people on the spectrum. And Daniel, I, I would prefer if you tell us a little bit about you. Sure. So uh, I'm a, a motivational speaker, and uh, we, we're in Ontario, for those who don't know. Uh, I'm a motivational speaker about what it's like to live on the spectrum. Uh, I'm on the spectrum myself. Um, I go around doing workshops, motivational speeches, uh, keynote speeches, different kinds of things, all in the name of advocating for better lives for people with autism. And you both run the popular Facebook page, Autism Goggles, is that correct? <laughs> and tell us about that. So Autism Goggles is a social initiative that, that we started because we want to help people to see life through the autism lens, so to speak. So we, we like it when people don't understand something or when they can't relate to why their loved one with autism um, is doing something or acts a certain way. We like them to think about it from that person's perspective and to... Uh, and essentially to try and understand why they act the way they are. Yeah, we, we um, strongly believe that behavior issues are not really behavior issues in the common understanding of that phrase. That a behavior issue is really a lack of understanding issue or a lack of appropriate support issue. So we really want to try and change people's understanding so that the actions they take will just naturally be more appropriate and a more respectful and supportive approach. I have a quote here that you said, when you're high functioning, society doesn't care about your needs. When you're low functioning, they don't care about your strengths. Can you talk a little bit about that? Pretty much. Um, there's, there's very little patience uh, for individuals like myself or like Daniel who are on the spectrum. If you can speak and you are average or higher uh, in intelligence, then the assumption is that if you um, are not able to manage your emotions or if you cannot perform a life skill or you um, are not comfortable in a social situation or myriad other issues, that that's a choice you're making. That you're just being difficult and you need to get it together and smarten up. Um, and so if you have sensory issues, you have learning differences, executive functioning issues, anxiety, sleep issues, tummy trouble, suck it up because you're smart and you can speak, so your issues are not really issues. By the same token, for the individuals that don't communicate in traditional ways, so with, with spoken language, um, the tendency is, is to teach, and I, I don't want to paint with too broad a stroke, but it tends to be that they are taught just the very basic life skills, uh, you know, to fold a mean towel in our systems of support, um, but the strengths that they have are not nurtured. They are not given academic curriculum. And I, I have met, I've had the privilege of meeting so many individuals who don't communicate in spoken word, who are um, absolutely brilliant, excellent writers, artists, uh, loving um, family members. And so there really just is a lack of understanding of autistic individuals across the spectrum. And also from across the spectrum, we need to understand each other better too. And we need to be united in the struggle to get supports for everyone of all needs, regardless of what those are. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree, and like, get to stay away from getting too political or anything, but um, a lot of local governments and local type, types of things, um, a lot of them do seem to sort of prioritize sort of service for, for certain people, and not understand the, the needs of other segments of the autism population. Um, so I do think that um, 
workshops, um, people usually have questions afterward or they want to talk about shared experiences. Um, so one time about a decade ago, somebody came up to me after all the questions were done when we were about to leave, and this man was nonverbal. He was sitting there playing with the truck that he had brought with him the entire presentation. Uh, and he probably would have been assessed below the first percentile. Uh, but he came up to me, and he had his mom with him, and she had a laminated sheet with the alphabet on it. And he started pointing to the letters and, and gave us a message, and he said, thank you, Daniel, for telling everyone how we feel. Mm. We are, have so much in common, and, and I think that's so important to get out there, that 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 everyone with autism has strengths and needs regardless of how they uh, project themselves. Yes, and we had a, a nonverbal individual who was assessed, who would have likely been assessed below the first percentile, and Daniel, who cognitively is very high and he's very highly verbal, uh, seemingly opposite in that way, and yet they were able to stand there and have a conversation the uh, other man by pointing to letters and having his mom read the, out his message, right? And so they had much more in common than they had to separate them. I mean, that was a long answer, wasn't it? Yeah, but was you know what? One. It was a very inspirational yes. answer, so we thank you for it. And. Uh, you know, one of the things that you talk about is, is how ignorance uh, it, it can come to the detriment when dealing with coping behaviors. So let's talk a little bit about, about that and, and, and what you mean by that. Sorry, I didn't hear the first part of that, Shannon. So uh, you talk about coping behaviors and how ignorance can get in the way of, of people being able to use coping behaviors. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so a lot of the time, a common misconception about autism is that anxiety is a symptom. That's just not true. And a lot of people with autism do have some kind of mental health challenge. Um, your statistics vary, but I think I, I see statistics ranging from about 70 to 80% of people have some kind of anxiety or depression or other mental health issue. But that's not something they're born with. Because you see, these things come from being misunderstood in a society that was really not built with autism in mind. So when, when, when the lights are too bright or when um, people expect you to remember too many things without having it written down or things like that, that can cause anxiety. And it's going to cause certain coping behaviors. So I, I think that um, I think that a lot of the time people try to address those behaviors rather than trying to get at the root cause. Would you say that's right? I, I do, and I, I also think that you know autism really is just another way of being human. It is a different way of learning, a different way of experiencing the sensory physical world. We know now that you know what, 90% of individuals with ASD have sensory and motor differences that are either the cause of their behaviors or emotional responses or are contributing to those. And, and we also know that autism is a social communication condition. And yet, where are the supports for those things? When we hand our precious children over to the school system, where the heck is the social communication curriculum? to teach them how to, you know, uh, initiate, maintain, and nurture friendship, how to resolve conflict, how to understand social situations in all different, um, in all different environments. We, we don't teach that, but we are quick to shame our children when they get it wrong, and that seems to be the practice, that we, we catch kids being autistic and then we shame them for it and say, don't do that, that's weird, instead of stepping back, trying to identify the gap in their understanding, and as the system of support as the adult, finding a way to teach that curriculum based on how they need. So because we don't do that, kids get anxious, uh, kids develop low self-esteem, because we don't, at least up here, we don't provide kids with comprehensive sensory assessments, um, and so we're not identifying.
identifying whether someone is under or oversensitive in any of the eight sensory uh, area sensory systems. And uh, again, if someone needs to engage in a behavior in order to pay attention, like not looking at the board and doodling and rocking while the teacher's talking, and that is how I can attend and learn. What we might hear from home is, Max is not paying attention. She's being rude and doodling while I am trying to teach. And so the coping behavior of an individual trying to do their best to pay attention is shamed and reprimanded. And we, you know, exacerbate and we add to the anxiety and the struggle of the individual. So rocking, chewing, ripping paper, uh, you know, eloping, whatever we do, you know, it, it's to try and cope with a world that moves too fast, right? With, with, with the academic curriculum, uh, sensory demands, social demands that really move too fast for many of us. We like to do things one at a time. One of the best descriptions I heard is that, you know, we are, we are 10 second people in a two second world. So, you know, we may all be just as capable as typical learners, but we definitely, um, uh, as a whole, learn in different ways, and we need those um, those ways of learning to be provided all the time. Not sometimes, if you luck into a teacher who happens to know, but all the time. And, and you know, that, that may move us to the next question, because we do believe that the root of desire, mental health issues, um, and, and lack of independence at adulthood, the root of that starts with the school system. Mm -hmm. Which I'm in such agreement, uh, and this is, uh, we, we're almost out of time, and so uh, we're going to have to cut it short, but this is why I'm huge fans of mm -hmm. yours, because you're so inspirational, and I think your message is uh, comes from uh, a place of truth and it's honest in a way that I don't think a lot of other people get to. And hearing you speak, I've seen videos of you guys speaking. Oh my gosh, if you need a speaker to come to something, you two are powerhouses and you really uh, move your audiences because it's this kind of message. Is this a message? Well, well, let's talk about how people can reach you. Yes, how can people get a hold of you and how can people see some of the videos of you speaking? So you can um, you can check us out at uh, Facebook on Autism Goggles, and you can also send us an email to autismgoggles at gmail.com. Okay, great. So if they're interested in you for speaking engagements or if you're just finding out more about um, your philosophies, they can reach out to you those ways. Yeah, and if, uh, if you are interested in seeing some of the videos that we have done, uh, you can just uh, put my name into YouTube, you'll see my TED Talk, you'll see uh, my address to the Center for Disease Control last year. And Which made me stand like up in my living room, Daniel. I stood up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, and we'd love for you to come back again because this was not long enough. Not would long you be enough. willing to do that? Sure. Thank you. That would be awesome. Thank okay. you. We Thank just, go ahead. You know what? We, we have so many followers now. We've been doing this for so long. We read very dire stories every day, people who are really struggling, and we have a lot of this in our, you know, friends and family, a lot of autism, and I, I don't know if I made it clear that I'm also on the spectrum, um, and so we just, we really just want to stop the pain that the lack of understanding is causing. It's not the autism, it's the ignorance of autism. And, Very and, and good I, note to leave on. Exactly. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing and everything that you're saying. We are going to bring you back because there are so many thing thank questions you. I have. But thank you so much for being with us. We're out of time, you guys. We're out of time. Uh, we've got thank a great you. show for you tomorrow. Please come back and see us tomorrow. Until then, give us, uh, your kiddos a hug from and me. And yourselves a hug from me. Bye-bye for Bye -bye now. Bye-bye for now. You guys.